praise, honor, and glory. At this time, we're about to begin our Bible study, our online Bible study. Before we begin, we'd like to have a prayer that will be offered by one of our own, Bishop W. L. Haygood. After that, we will come back with our Bible study lesson for tonight. Amen. Greetings, audience. We're so grateful to be coming to you and sharing the word of God at this pandemic time. And God is the same today as he was yesterday and forevermore. Pray with me everywhere, anywhere, all throughout the world. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Oh, we are so grateful. We are so thankful. We have a heart of joy and gratitude and gladness, oh Father, that you spared our lives so many days and so many times from danger seen and unseen. We thank you this evening that you gave us food and gave us shelter and gave us warning and protection. For you said, obey the civil law of the land. So we thank you for the warning and for the precautionary factors that are involved in us still working in your vineyard and working on this battlefield. Yes, God bless us and may your face shine upon us and may our, your best be ours. In Jesus' name we pray for America and the countries throughout the world for you have the whole world in your hand, and the earth is the Lord, and the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. You had founded it upon the sea, and established it upon the flood. Open up your gates, ye everlasting door, and let the king of glory come in. Let America, let, Amer let the king of glory come into our hearts by worshiping him, and praising him in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray, thank God. Amen. 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 We thank God for Bishop Haygood offering prayer for us tonight, and we will now begin our Bible study lesson for tonight. As I told you on last week, we know that this is a different method for us studying God's Word, but we can still study God's Word. We are here together. If you have questions, you may send those in, and we'll do our very best to answer those questions as we're going. Tonight we have a lesson that has been asked of one of our members a few months ago and we thank God we're being able to get to it tonight. And the Bible study that and the question that this individual had was, can a person be cursed? And if a person is cursed, how can you tell that that person is cursed? Very good topic. Is there such thing as a person being cursed? And if they are cursed, how can you tell that they are cursed? And also, the individual wants to know, what should we do if we find ourselves around someone that is cursed, if it's possible for them being cursed? So that's a lot for us to dive into. And as we begin, the first thing we want to make sure we understand is that when we're referring to the word cursed, we're not referring to what most people call cussing, you know, in in time, some people, they confuse curse with cussing. Now, as far as cussing, we're referring to the fact that people are using what the old saints would call Sunday school words. You know, when you're calling somebody something out of their name and you use some words that ought not be used, that's what we call cussing. And then, you know, some people got a little fans and they say, you're cursing. But we're not dealing with that form of cursing or cussing. We're referring to that cursing that means the opposite of being blessed. Yes. We're referring to cursing as blessing being the fact that things are going well and prosperous in your life, and cursing as things are going the other way. 
Explain. things are going down in your life. You, you're struggling with poverty. You're dealing with mental issues. You're dealing with Explain what it. the old saints call generational curses. And some people say it like you're having what they call buzzard luck. You can't kill nothing and nothing would die. So we're referring to the fact of the opposite of being blessed. So when we dive into this lesson, we're, we're discussing can a person be cursed? That's what we'll start with. And the short answer to that is yes. There is a such thing as a person being cursed. Now also let me emphasize that we're not referring to black magic. We're not referring to voodoo. We're referring to the fact that things just aren't going well in a person's life. And they have, as some people call, bad luck on their side. But it's a curse. So can a person be cursed? Short answer is yes. And we're going to begin this lesson by starting with the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 26. So we're going to begin by looking at Proverbs 26. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And as we look at that, we're going to set our groundwork to see about cursing, being cursed. Proverbs 26. Proverbs 26. And we're going to begin at verse 1. Proverbs 26, and we shall look at verse 1. Now, if you will allow me to not dive into some of these verses as much as I will, because I want to get to the meat of the lesson, Amen. which is the being cursed section. All right, Proverbs 26 and verse 1, and we're going to also look at verse 2. So if we have that, let's allow us to hear the reading of that word. As snow in summer, as snow is in the summer, and as rain in the harvest, so honor is not seemly for a fool. Now, the first thing we look here is the writer here is actually trying to give us some ideas and some concepts of some things just don't seem normal. Hmm. If you have snow in the summertime, it just doesn't seem normal. <laughs> if you have rain in the harvest season, it just doesn't seem normal. Jesus. If you have honor given to a fool, it just certainly doesn't seem normal. Jesus. So there's something unnatural when these things occur. Now verse two says what? As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse calls less shall not come. Now, the first thing we see here, what we're saying is, if there's a curse, you better believe that there's a reason that a person is cursed. Jesus. So you're not cursed just by happenstance. Jesus. You're not cursed just Woo. by a whim. Jesus. There's something that has occurred oh. that allowed the curse to come. Jesus. Now, let's understand what, what, what happens to cause the curse to come. And this is short out as well, but it's just point blank. The reason some people are cursed in their lives is because they disobey the word of God. When you don't do what God says do, or when you do those things that God says don't do, then you have caused yourself to be cursed. So what am I saying? What I'm saying is for the most part, being cursed is a self-inflicted wound. Mm. Being cursed is not caused by other people, mm. it's caused by us. We wow. cause our own problems. One, one writer says like this, you're doing it to yourself. So what, what happens here is, when we disobey God, when we don't do what God says do, we now, don't, we do not allow God to bless us, but we have the other side of that. Now I know this is different teaching from some people because we're at a point in time now where there's teaching that all we, we hear is God wants to bless you. All we hear is God wants you to live your best life. God's gonna do this for you. He's gonna give you a new job. God is gonna make sure you have a new house. All that's fine and good. God will do that. But if you do not live like God says live, if you disobey God, then you open yourself up. We open ourselves up to be cursed. Now, in other words, being cursed or being blessed basically comes down to a choice. What do you want to be? Do you want to be blessed or do you want to be cursed? Do it like God said do it. Now, let's go to the book of Genesis. And let's see how we can dive in and see what really happens here. The book of Genesis. And we're going to start at the beginning and we're going to work our way through. And this will possibly be a two or three week lesson. But we want to get make sure we set the groundwork so we can understand 
that you have to do what God says do if you want the blessings of God. If you don't do what God says do, then there's only one other thing that can happen to you. You're either blessed or you're cursed. All right, Genesis, the third chapter. Genesis, the third chapter. And let's look. Let's start at the 14th verse. Most of you know this. We're pretty familiar with this story. The story of Adam and old sister Eve. The story where we find the first record of what some call a henpecked man. The first record where wife offers something and the man goes along with it instead of putting his foot down and saying, no, nah, we're not going to do it like that. That's the first record we have here in Genesis. Genesis 3 and verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, uh -huh. because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now, what has happened here? What did you do? What did you do, uh, Mr. Serpent? The serpent beguiled Eve. We know this. In other words, the serpent got with Eve, and he told her some things that sounded pretty good to her. He twisted up some scriptures to see if she actually knew what the scriptures were really saying. And he, 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 he tricked Eve, per se. He tricked Eve, deceived Eve, and Eve ate off the fruit. Now, when Eve ate off of the fruit, then she gave up her husband, and her, uh, her husband ate off the fruit. So now, here, God talking to the serpent and saying, you know what, since you're playing games and you're and, and you, you messing over Eve and you, you deceive Eve, you are cursed. In other words, now there's going to be judgment on you. Now things not going to go like they were planning to go. Now, I've heard an old individual say once that before the times of of the curse that the serpent walked upright like everyone else. I wasn't here back then, so I don't know that, but we do know that the punishment or the curse was now he's going to lie on his belly. He's going to crawl on his belly, and, and now we're going to have dust from here on going into his nostrils, into his mouth. So, all right, let's see what we have verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. We have an arch enemy, mm -hmm. and that is the serpent. Mm -hmm. God is saying here, there's gonna always be problems between the snake, the snake family, and the human family. Mm -hmm. All right, come on, let's go. 16. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow, and thy conception. And sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, here we have the consequences of sin. Once again, I first told you that anytime we have a curse, that means there was a choice made, a choice meant we disobeyed God, we didn't do what God said do, and now we have to deal with the consequences. Now, the woman, since you did what you did, now you're gonna have sorrow in conception. In other words, we call those labor pains. Most women have labor pains now. They have shots now that try to take away the pain. They have all type of medicinal ideas that they try to make sure that the woman can be as comfortable as possible, but the pain was put there by Christ. The pain was put there by God. Why is that? Because the woman did not do what God said do. All right, verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Stop right there. Now, notice here, God tells Adam, because you listen to your wife. Now, this doesn't mean that a husband has no business taking the time and saying, honey, what do you think about this or what do you think about that? This doesn't mean that. So please don't try to use this verse to say that I can be a male chauvinist and that I'm just dominant. No, it's not saying that. But when God has laid down the rules, 
When God has said, this is how we're doing it, I don't care who tells you to go against God, you shouldn't go against God. That's, that's wife, that's mama, that's daddy. We have to be able to stand and do exactly what God says do. Amen. God gave Adam the order. Amen. God told Adam, this is what we you to do. Now, we notice here that the one that God gave the rule to is the one that he called when the rule was broken. We do remember that once they sinned, when God came walking down through the through the garden, he asked for Adam. He said, Adam, well, what is this that thou hast done? In other words, the man should have been strong enough to say, honey, it doesn't matter what you say we're doing. We're not going to go against what God says do. So what am I saying here? Sometimes we allow other people to cause curses to come in our lives because they persuade us to not do to not do what God says do. So we have to stand firm on God's word, and it doesn't matter what anyone else says, we have to be like Joshua, where Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And we're going to make sure that wife doesn't take us off God's word, husband don't take us off God's word, children won't take us off God's word. We're going to stand firm and do what God said do. All right, now, so when we look at that, not only... Are they cursed? But now the ground now has to deal with it. So in other words, when we mess up, when we sin, there are other situations that will occur and happen because of our wrongdoing. Right. I can't be a father or, or a parent and my sin not affect my child, Amen. not affect my wife, not affect my friends. Amen. So our choices, they will affect other people. So we have to be careful with, to make sure that we do what we're supposed to do because our downfall can sometimes bring others down and make them fall as well. All right, come on. So the ground now has to deal with the issues. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Now I have to work all hard. Come on. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Now I have to work the field now. Now things won't come easy. I have to work. All this is because of one thing, disobeying God. The curse came because we disobeyed God. Come on. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Now I got to work. Come on. Sweat hard. That's right. That's right. You got to sweat hard. In the sweat. Till thou return unto the ground. Mm -hmm. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, mm. and unto dust shalt thou return. I have to work hard now. Consequences of my sins. Adam's sin caused the whole human race now to have to deal with the consequences of sin. Adam's sin caused the earth to have to deal with the consequences of his sin. And we have to make sure we understand this. Whenever there is sin, there's a consequence for sin. Amen. Let's look at Genesis 12. Genesis 12. Okay. And we're going to look at, start at the first verse. We know Genesis 12, we're discussing Abram, who most of us call Abraham later on in life. So we're looking at Abram. And let's see what we have here. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Okay. Get thee out of thy country. Now, God is telling Abram, it's time to move. Mm. When God tells us to do something, we have to do it. We, we, we don't have time to wonder, God, what's going on here? We have to move when God says move. All right? God is in control. This is God's thing. As Bishop was praying, he said, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. This is God's thing. So we have to do what God says to do. God tells Abraham, I need you to move. Come on. And from thy kindred and from thy father's house mm. unto a land that I will show thee. Now, you have to understand this. God tells a man, I need you to get away from your family. Go to a place that you have no idea where you're going, and I'm going to show you where you need to be. You would think that it would be a blessing to be around your family. You would think that it's a blessing to be right there with mama and with daddy and with Uncle Jim and with, with Cousin Jojo. But sadly, 
There are times in life when the reason that you're not blessed, when you're not living your best life, is because the people around you, even family, can sometimes be the ones that are pulling you down. So when God tells you it's time to move, sometimes God is telling you you have to move away from family. Sometimes God is telling you it's time to get out your father's house. And if you have a real father or real daddy, a real daddy will tell you if you're a young man, it's time for you to get out of my house. Mm -hmm. I, I, I oftentimes tell Heavenly Bishop was laughing. When I came home from work, I just got my first job, my first, my first real job, my first teaching job. And I saw my daddy pull the truck across the yard. And I was wondering, like, what is this crazy man doing? And when I went in the house, I said, like, man, what you doing? He said, no, nah, it ain't what I'm doing. It's what you doing. I'm like, what you mean what I'm doing? He said, you getting out of my house. Oh. So in other words, he was saying, it's time for you to get out of daddy's house and be a man and stand on your own. A lot of times, that's the reason we have so many, forgive me for this word, but so many sorry young men yeah. is because daddies aren't there yeah. to let them know that there's a time when you have to get out of your daddy's house. You can't have too many grown people oh. in the same house. Oh. So sometimes you got to move. And sometimes God is going to tell you, when you move, make this move, get away from your family. I don't need you depending on mom. I don't need you depending on dad. I don't need you depending on your aunts and uncles. I need you to depend totally on me. So it's time for you to get away from your family. Okay, come on. Let's see what he says here. And I will make of thee a great nation. Do what I'm saying, do, And I'm going to make a great nation of y'all. And I will bless thee. Uh-huh. And make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. Now, not only am I going to bless you, he's saying you're going to be okay. Your name is going to be well known. You'll be world renowned. Alright? And then watch this. Not only are you going to be blessed, but you're going to be a blessing. In other words, when God blesses us, we should be blessers. Yeah. A lot of us want to be just blessees, but we don't be blessers. Somewhere we have to realize that when God gives to us and when God lifts us up, it's not for us to look down on other people, but it's for us to be blessed to other people and lift other people up. Do something for someone else. Always be willing to make sure that we be a blessing to other people. And sometimes all you have to do, it's not always about giving people financially. You can be a blessing to somebody by just giving them an encouraging word, Amen. by just patting them on the back sometimes. Sometimes they just say something that will lift their head. So we have to make sure we understand when God blesses us, we're willing to be a blessing to someone else. All right, come on. Now watch this verse here. And I will bless them that bless thee. Now, God is telling Abraham, get away from your family. Go where I'm telling you to go. And I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. You're going to be able to bless other people. And now he says, anybody that blesses you, I'm going to bless them. Come on. And curse him that curses thee. Anybody that curses you. No. Now, this doesn't mean anybody that calls you a so-and-so. This doesn't mean anyone that says you ain't no good and your mama ain't no good, even your greasy grandmama. Nah, we're not talking about them cursing that gift. He's saying anyone that does well towards you and does things to benefit you, I'm going to benefit them. Now, but he, on the flip side of that coin, anybody that tries to do you harm, anybody that tries to bother you, hinder you, then God is saying, you ain't got to get them. I'm going to get them. Amen. That lets us know that there are some people that God has chosen in life sure. that are dangerous sure. for you to bother. Sure. We need to make sure we understand, leave people alone when God is in their lives. Because God is saying, now, if, I, if you bother them, then I got you. So now, look what he says. He said, I'm going to bless them that bless you. I'm going to curse them that curse you. All right, come on, let's read. And then these shall all families of the earth be blessed. Messianic prophecy. Amen. Heirs of Abraham. Amen. Whole nations will be blessed. All right, come on, let's go to Genesis 9. Let's go to Genesis 9. Now, I'm, I'm flipping around here. I just want to get the, lay the groundwork for blessings and curses. Genesis 9, and I want to make sure we understand how things are working so far. Very Can good. a person be cursed? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Genesis 9. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. And we're going to, let's look at verse 20. Genesis 9 and verse 20. Pastor. Yes, sir. Teacher, I don't want to mess up your teaching, but you know, I found out that uh, you can be cursing yourself and don't realize. 
That's right. Most people, most people, and I hate to say it like this, and we're going to get to it, hopefully we get to these verses tonight. Most people don't realize that the blessings of God, my dad always had a saying, he would tell us, he's like, boy, the only person who can stop you from being blessed is you. You can stop yourself from being blessed. Amen. Most people, we always blame other people for our issues, Amen. for our faults, and it's someone else's fault, but we never look inwardly to see what am I doing. Amen. Because so far, the scriptures we just read, Adam, if, if we went back to the beginning with Genesis, and for lack of time, I want to make sure I just got to the gist of the cursing. But when Adam sinned, and when God called Adam to the carpet, Adam said, it's the woman. The reason I messed up is because the woman you gave me. Now look what he's saying. He was really saying that God, you know, it was the woman fault, but I wouldn't even have that woman if you wouldn't have given it to me. Yeah. You know, see, so he was trying to put the blame on someone else. Yeah. So what we look at, the woman now says, well, you know, it was the serpent fault. Yeah. So the serpent was the problem. So everybody was trying to play the blame game, and the same blame game is still being played today. Everybody wants to say it's somebody else's fault why I'm going through what I'm going through, Amen. why I'm not having success in my life, why I'm not happy, why I'm so sad always. The reason my life is jacked up and torn up is because my daddy was on drugs, because my mama did this. Now, those play a part in partially, but at the end of the day, if you want to be blessed, you have to do what God says do, and if you don't do what God says do, you're cursed, and you're choosing to be cursed. All right, come on, let's read this. Genesis 9 and 20. This talks about Noah and his children. Nine and twenty. Nine and twenty. Let's see what we have here. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. Now look what Noah did. Noah has now gotten all off the ark and all that good stuff. And Noah is going to have a vineyard. A farm. Come on. And he drank of the wine. Look at him. Sure did, God. Noah. Drank of the wine. Can I say it like this? Say it. Noah became a bootlegger. Yeah. Boot a moonshine maker. Yeah. Let me say it like that. Noah made him some wine. Yeah. Made him some wine. Uh, he made him some wine. Shame on The old man. saying would say some, some Morgan David. He made him some wine, all right? So now here's Noah. He gets, he drinks some wine, and let's see what happened there. And was drunken. He got drunk. Noah, Noah got drunk. Oh, Rev Noah. He was saying it's going to rain out the wild. But all that hard work and all that hammering on that ark, Noah said, well, it's time to sit back and cool out. And now Noah drinks him some wine and he gets drunk. All right, come on. And he was uncovered within his tent. He got so drunk that he got naked, uncovered. His clothes off. Tell and it's amazing how when people get drunk, some, some folks say that they, 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 get, they get warm on the inside, that antifreeze gets to them, and they have to take their clothes off. It's too, it's, it's too, it's too hot. So now Noah ends up taking his clothes off in his tent. Come on. And Ham, one of his sons, the father of Canaan, his grandson, saw the nakedness of his father mm -hmm. and told his two brethren without. Now, whenever you see this when it says the son and the grandson saw the nakedness, realize that it's not like it is today. In today's society, there's no shame in being seen naked. Uh -huh. We can see that with how people dress and how people go out with half naked and whole naked as well. But in these days, it was shameful for someone to see you if you weren't fully covered. So now, as a matter of fact, if you saw, if a young man or a child saw their parent naked, then Ooh. that was actually a crime. Yep. And you could do something to the child. Right. So now, in that case now, so let's, let's make sure we understand it's not like it is now, all right? So now, here's the young man. He sees daddy naked. All right? He sees daddy naked. And instead of him trying to correct the problem, he goes and says, hey, let me tell y'all something. Guess what I just saw? And there are a lot of people that feel like everything that they see, they have to tell it. There are some things that you may see in life that it doesn't call for you to tell. It calls for you to work and try to fix it. So here he goes and he wants to tell it. Now let's see what he does. Uh, 22. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And told his two brethren without. Told his two brethren, all right. And Shem and Jephthah took a garment and laid it up on both their shoulders and went backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. Now, these other two brothers, they realized, okay, daddy messed up. Daddy and their naked. Instead of them going there to peep and see, let's see what's going on, they decided to make sure they do something to protect daddy. Right. So they got covered in, and they walked backwards. Yeah. They walked backwards in and they covered their father up. Now, that lets us know that just because people fall, yeah. just because people stumble, yeah. just because people have issues, yeah. you don't have to broadcast it. You can do all you can, even if someone else tells you about it. You don't have to spread it. Now, they could either went and told, let's tell some more folks. But look what happens here. They said, we're going to cover this thing up. We're going to do our best to make sure daddy gets covered. We don't want daddy to be in shame like this. Let's cover daddy up. But we don't want to see it. We actually walk backwards to make sure we don't even see it. All right, come on. And Noah awoke from his wine. He finally woke up. He'd been asleep. I'm not going to say hungover. We modernize it and say he had a hangover. Yep. And he finally woke up. All right, come on. And knew what his younger son had done unto him. Look what my boy did to me. Come on. Unto him. And he said, Curse be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brother. Uh-huh. So know what he said? He said, uh-huh. Since you want to do this and you want to you want to put my business out there like that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to speak a curse mm -hmm. on your son mm -hmm. and all his descendants. Mm -hmm. Now, they're going to be servants. And this is where you have people that say that there's a certain race of people. That's the reason they're cursed because they are descendants of Ham. And that's where that comes from. That's where a lot of people say that. But he said, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to curse your, your, your son and, and, your, and your descendants. Yes. Because you did what you've done. You shouldn't have done that. Yeah. You saw daddy drunk. You saw daddy naked. You shouldn't have went and told that. You should have done something to correct the problem. Come on. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. Okay, verse 26. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Now, one brother, one brother received cursing. All right, come on. Here comes the other brother. He receives blessing. Come on. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Now, here comes the other brother. God is going to enlarge his territory. So this lets us know. The actions that these individuals did caused them to either be blessed or caused them to be cursed. Once again, you have to choose yeah. to be blessed yeah. or choose to be cursed. Yeah. And it's one or the other. It's one or the other. So he said, now, if you do it the right way, you'll be blessed. If you do it the wrong way, you'll be cursed. We have to do what God says do. All right, let's look at Genesis 22. Now we're in one book, and we see all these blessings and curses already. It's just in the first book of the Bible. Amen. Genesis 22. And let's see what we have here. Looks like we're, we're visiting Abraham. Yeah. Genesis 22, and let's start at verse 1. We're going to do verse, let's start at verse 1, and we go to 1 to 3, and then we'll do some skipping around. And it came to pass after these things, that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Mm -hmm. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. Now, hold right there. Let's get our background here. We know that Abraham wanted a son, and we know that he was old, and we know that his wife Sarah was old and she was also barren. Yeah. Now, but God promised them a son. Yeah. Now, when God promised them this son, they're figuring that there's no way that God can give me a son and my wife is old and barren and now I have my 
my body, I'm old, and God is going to give me a son? No way possible. But now remember, these are the times like, like, like it is now. There, there was no pill back in that day that could get Abraham some help. Those days were over with. They couldn't go to the clinic and say, okay, we're going to find a surrogate mother and things like that. No, it wasn't like that. They weren't going to get shots and pills. What they had to do is just trust God. Now, look what happened here. Sarah and Abraham, they believed that God was going to do it. That's what they said. But here comes Sarah who loves her husband so much. And I'm not sure there are any women nowadays still living that love their husband like Sarah loves Abraham. Go ahead. First off, she called Tell him Lord. Me. And then look what she did. She said, my husband wants a son, so I'm going to set my husband up with another woman so she can have a son. Now, as I said, I don't think many women live nowadays that would do that. But here's the thing. Once she set it up, she tells Abraham, you go and lie with the maiden. They have the baby. Now she has a problem with the baby. Now, that lets us know you shouldn't try to fix things that God has already told he's going to fix. Right. God had already given the promise. You just wait on the promise. Because if you put your hand in it, if you put your ideas in it, then you're going to mess it up. Now we have this big mess, and now instead of having just Isaac being the son of promise, now we had another son that went by the name of Ishmael. Now, Ishmael was a son of Abraham, but he wasn't the son of promise. So now we have this whole big issue, all because Sarah, loving her husband, wants to do something to help her husband get what he wants. Now, that kind of ties to that old song where it said, love will make you do wrong and love will make you do right. Talk. That's what Al Green would say, make you come home early, make you stay, stay out all night. So here we have, she tried to fix this problem. Now, once they go through all this ordeal, they get rid of the, the maiden and all of that put out the house. Now, God gives them the son of promise. When he gets the son of promise, who Abraham loves, now God says, I need you to give me back what I gave you. Amen. The same son Amen. Yes, that I gave you. Yes, yes. Give him back to me. And here we have Isaac. God says, Abraham, take Isaac. And I need you to sacrifice him. All right, come on, let's read up. Yes, Lord Jesus. And offer him therefore a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now, once again, God says, I tell you. Notice here, every move that Abraham is making, God is saying, I'm going to tell you what to do. And I oftentimes teach him here at Union Grove, I tell him, when you're a child of God, you don't have to make decisions. All you have to do is follow direction. The Bible says, in all thy ways, acknowledge him. And he shall direct thy path. So God is directing him on everything to do. He said, now I need you to go to Moriah. I need you to sacrifice your son. And I'm going to tell you everything you need to do. All right, come on, let's go to verse 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. He is. And saddled his ass. Okay. And took two of his young men with him. Mm -hmm. And Isaac, his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering. And rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. In other words, he's doing just what God told him to do. He, he's making preparations to sacrifice his son. And why is that? Because God told him to do it. In other words, when God tells you to do something, it may not sound like something that you want to do. It may not be something that you want to do. But if God says it, then it's not up for option. When God says, thou shalt love, he means thou shalt love. When God says, thou shalt not, he means thou shalt not. It's not up for debate. We can't say, Lord, let's make a deal. God is saying, no, nah, here's the deal. You do this, I'll do that. So now, here Abraham goes, and Abraham prepares himself to sacrifice his son. Let's go down to verse 9, and let's see what happens there. And they came to the place. They got there, okay. Which God had told him of. Okay. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. He is prepared to sacrifice his son, the same son he loved, the same son that God promised him, he's preparing to do just what God told him to do, sacrifice him. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. In other words, he, not only has he tied his son and prepared, he's getting ready to do it. He had his arm up ready. In other words, he said, I'm going to do just what God told me to do. Come on, verse 11. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. Mm -hmm. And he said, here am I. 
And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Now, what is he saying there? The voice tells him, you know what? I realize now, if God tells you to do it, Abraham, you'll do it. You'll do it. You respect God enough. You reverence God enough that you can, you will do what God tells you to do. Now, that's how we have to be in life. We have to get to the point where we trust God enough to do whatever he tells us, no matter how strange it may seem, no matter how hard it may seem, we have to still say, you know what? I'm going to do just what God told me to do. Now, let's go down to verse 15. For teaching. Yes, sir. That's what you call exercising your faith, isn't it? That's why the Bible says that Abraham was the father of the faithful. Yes, yes. That's why we call him the father of the faithful. Yes. Abraham was, was willing to say, okay, now first off, you have to understand, it takes some faith yes. to leave an area of comfort yes. and go somewhere yes. that you know nothing about. Amen. But God do that. It takes some faith to believe that God is going to give you a son and you old already and your wife is old and bad. So that, that you got some strikes against you. Yes. It takes some faith now to say, I'm going to sacrifice this son. And then earlier on, God told his son when his son asked, well, I, um, Abraham told his son when, when the son asked, Daddy, what's going on here? This is like we do when we sacrifice that God will provide for himself a ram. So God was letting Abraham see, will you do what I want you to do? And we see that Abraham was willing to do it. Come on, let's go down to verse 15 and see what happens here. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham uh -huh. from heaven the second time. Mm. He started talking with the angel, come on. And said, by myself have I sworn, uh -huh. said the Lord, for thou hast 